Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with a like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Veronica Sanchez. Veronica M E D C A B C C B T. DTKA is the founder of the Cooperative Paws Service Dog Coach, an educational certification program for professional trainers in service dog training. Veronica also offers a variety of online courses and often speaks and writes on service dogs for professional associations. She is the author of the book Service Dog Coaching, a guide for pet dog trainers. Veronica has a master's degree in education and a bachelor's in psychology from George Mason University. She also has a certificate in brain research and education from the University of Washington. Veronica has supported owner trainers training service dogs for mobility, hearing, mental health, neurological problems, and dual guide mobility work. Her interest in service dogs is both personal and professionals. She has a disability herself, a neurological condition called generalized dystonia, and she has trained her own dogs to assist as service dogs. So without further ado, it's our very great pleasure to welcome Veronica to the show today. She's patiently waiting by. Veronica, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we haven't done an episode, we're 133 episodes in and we haven't done an, an episode specifically on service dogs before, so this is pretty exciting. Oh wow, I'm honoured then. Yeah, and I know, it's, uh, I know it's going to be an important episode uh, for people that might not have heard of you and what you do, um, and might mm-hmm. not have a network uh, to assist with them if, if they are somebody and I know that we have numerous uh, probably a significant amount of people in our audience that uh, either have their own service dog or have clients who have service dogs uh, and, and I generalize that based on our membership I know we've got mm-hmm. uh, trainers with clients who have service dogs and I know we have uh, individual members who are training their own service dogs so I'm excited I'm excited because uh, we can create this bridge between uh, their membership and their engagement with Animal Training Academy and the work that you're that you're doing, because um, I think it's going to help. Oh, wonderful! Well, I'm excited about it too, and I'm always excited to see a growing interest um, from the pet training and animal training community and the service dog world. Yeah, and uh, such a cool area and way that we can uh, engage with our canine companions. So let's mm-hmm. dive straight in though and go back in time. Because I'm interested mm-hmm. to learn a little bit about your story, Veronica. We said a little bit about it mm-hmm. uh, in the intro there. But to get started, can you take us back to where you first started to learn about positive reinforcement animal training uh, and share your story uh, that started from that point and led up to where you are today? Basically, I started when I was in high school. I decided I was going to get my first dog. And my parents said, this is officially your first dog. And this was, uh, my goodness, I'm old. This was the 80s, the late 80s. And um, and I had that dog through college. And this was a dog that was, um, that I just thought I had done research. But, you know, you're, you're you know, 17, 18, your version of research. And it was at the time. So in any case, it was, he was a backyard 
bred dog, and he was probably a Siberian Husky. Uh, we knew he was Siberian Husky one half, and the other part was probably either Chow or Akita. So not a great starter combination for your first time dog owner for a for a high school girl that you know really didn't know anything but you know back then you think you know I thought I knew a lot and I read different books and uh you know had a lot of trouble managing um his behavior I took uh training classes locally at the time I took a lot of different classes while I was a college student um, and then all the way through, even well, because I kept training him, I was very persistent. I'll say that I even, even when things weren't working out, I kept, I was like, well, I, maybe I just need to try a different class or maybe I need to try a different instructor. So I kept training him and it took a while, uh, because at that point I was, uh, the, all the classes near me were all traditional methods, old, old fashioned, um, uh, choke chain, prong collar that un unfortunately that, um, and then finally, um, by this point, I was in graduate school. I found some classes near me that were positive reinforcement. It was my first time going into positive reinforcement. And um, this dog, it, it was he was it was kind of it was kind of funny because I I remember taking him out. I would always take him to a particular park where they had an ice an outdoor ice cream shop. So you could buy ice cream and um, just from like a little booth and I would buy him ice cream and <laughs> I would give him this ice cream and, and he was very dog reactive. But while I would notice that while he, I was feeding him ice cream, dogs could pass by him and it didn't matter. They could be almost right behind him and he was focused on the ice cream. And I remember thinking at the time, I wish I could just carry ice cream everywhere. It didn't occur to me <laughs> that I could possibly use something that wouldn't melt. Uh, so a little bit more convenient. But when I did finally um, find this wonderful uh, dog training school near me, which was the, the first one in the area to use positive reinforcement, um, this, he turned around very, very quickly. He responded uh, to the training methods. Uh, he was, uh, we both did very, very well. I continued taking lots and lots of classes with this uh, place because now we were having fun and now we were really getting somewhere. And um, the place where I had taken all these classes at eventually ended up actually uh, hiring me. They did, um, they, it was, it was really, I really got lucky in, um, because uh, truly I, at the time I was, I was just looking for a location that was convenient and uh, near me, but this facility was really um, uh, leading the way. And then, and I, I'm right outside of Washington D.C. in the Northern Virginia area. That with positive reinforcement training, they actually had me do an apprenticeship, and this would have been the like 1992, 1993. I did an apprenticeship under one of their instructors, and I started teaching um, group training classes. I taught uh, puppy classes primarily, but I also did some, they had like at that time, they called them teenage dog classes. And then we had uh, some other typical uh, training classes, canine good citizen. And my interest at the time, based on my experience, I was interested in a lot of aspects of dog training, but I was very interested in reactive dogs because that's what I had started with. Um, and I, I had actually, um, I had eventually trained him and he, we were doing some visits at um, assisted living nursing homes. So I had some interest in therapy, therapy dogs too, but um, it didn't, uh, the service dog world didn't even occur to me as anything within reach because at that time there was just no, nobody was actually training their own dogs for service work. And if you were in a pet dog field, you didn't encounter service dog that she just seemed like another, another world. Um, I was, uh, at this point, I was teaching elementary school kids by day, and then I would teach uh, puppy classes and basic classes for this uh, business in the evenings, and they were both in the same neighborhood, so sometimes I would have students uh, some of the children from the that I had been working with in school, they would show up in my class. So I had a lot of energy back then. When I look back on that, I don't know how I did that. <laughs> so it's like work with six year olds in the day and then go home, exercise the dogs, go back out, <laughs> teach puppy class at night. <laughs>
you know, repeat, <laughs> do that again. Um, but anyway, I absolutely loved it. And, um, and that, and I did, you know, some version of that for a number of years. And then, uh, then what happened is I, uh, I got sick. I developed a, a severe, uh, neurological disorder called generalized dystonia. Um, I was about 29 or 30 years old. And all of a sudden I had this and generalized dystonia. I mean, you know, sometimes I always have to say it's, it's like not a country in, you know, Eastern Europe. Dystonia is actually a neurological condition and it's in the same, um, family of, it's a movement disorder that's in the same family as Parkinson's disease. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, uh, various types of forms uh, from it. They consider my form to be genetic, but we don't actually know the gene. And it's very, so I basically have a rare form of a rare disease. And, um, and I was essentially a healthy person who suddenly had this unexpected dramatic uh, change. I was suddenly having a lot of difficulty moving, uh, uh, couldn't a uh, difficulty controlling my hands, my legs, and all of my life basically just came to a grinding halt. When something with a health problem that's severe and you all of a sudden don't know, all of a sudden my life revolved around going to these major medical institutions, uh, Johns Hopkins, the NIH hospitalizations, my life, my calendar was just a string of doctor appointments. I had to stop work. Um, and, and truthfully, it was a really dark, dark time. Um, I did not know at that point, you know, um, sort of what to do with myself. And um, I, and you, and especially when, you know, you start, you, you just, uh, I had lost a lot of confidence in my ability to sort of do anything. Um, and I, I got online and thanks to the magic of the internet <laughs> that I ended up connecting with other dog, uh, dog trainers and also people with disabilities on some listservs that were particularly interested in using, uh, positive training for service dogs. And, um, and there was a mix of people in some of these, uh, the listservs, some of them were professional service dog trainers. Some of the people worked for service dog programs and some of the people were, uh, people with disabilities who were just trying to learn as much as they could. And I initially became interested because I wanted to learn how to train my own dog for service work. But um, as I started learning more and, and reading um, the various uh, posts and, and things that other people were sharing, I became interested in the service dog industry as a whole. Um, I ended up volunteering for a nonprofit service dog program and um, really became um, fascinated by all types of service dogs. Not, and, it, and I always say service dog world is, is really large. Every single type of service dog is in a way its own specialty. But I was um, really fascinated by that. And as I also gained experience training my own dog for service work, I started realizing that even though I had this movement disorder and my movement was impaired, there was still a lot I could do dog training wise. And that gave me the confidence to, for my husband and I to open up Cooperative Paws, which is uh, initially, uh, and the, my goal there was basically to, um, to do what I had done for myself, help people with disabilities uh, train their own dog for surface work, if, and then also to offer pet dog training. And I ended up doing everything, you know, even reactive dogs, behavior work, the, the, whole, the whole nine yards. Um, and then as what happens sometimes uh, not uncommon with people with uh, chronic health conditions is my health took another turn for the worse. This was about five years ago. And once again, I found I had to recalibrate. Um, I could not continue um, doing all this in-person work. At, at this point, my, I was having some pulmonary um, issues. It was just the fatigue and the pulmonary compromise was just too much. So I started at I started having to look for trainers to refer clients to. And I'm really fortunate that this area where I live in has amazing positive trainers. I mean, we have some incredibly highly skilled, talented, um, gifted trainers. And so as I'm, you know, ref uh, people ask me for help and I can send my I had lots of wonderful people to send even very serious behavior problems to. Um, lots of great trainers for everything, puppy training, everything. 
except for service dog training. I couldn't find anyone to refer my service dog clients to. And I would talk to my colleagues and what I learned by talking to my friends and colleagues in the industry was that they felt like they didn't know enough about service dogs. Um, and I would, and I realized that there was a real need to bridge that gap of uh, between the pet dog world and the service dog world, because now there were more and more owner trainers, uh, and that's people with disabilities who wanted to train their own dog for service work. They were reaching out and they couldn't find trainers to help them. And um, you know, it's one of the things we say, we don't want people to do it on them, their own, or maybe they've picked an inappropriate dog, but or maybe they've picked a great dog, but they aren't doing the training that's necessary. Well, they need that guidance. They need that professional guidance in order to do it um, appropriately. So that's what led to my uh, sort of changing gears with Cooperative Paws and uh, offering education uh, for professional pet dog trainers in service dog training. And so that's where we have the uh, service dog coaching certificate program and also um, a variety of sort of uh, short on-demand courses on uh, various service dog training related topics. And I love seeing this, um, just a growing interest from pet dog trainers in uh, off supporting owner trainers and also pet some of the um, service dog coaching program graduates also work for nonprofit programs. I just, I love seeing this um, area and the, the bridge grow. You know, awesome. And thank you so much for, for bravely sharing in there uh, in about your generalized Estonia, which is not a country in Eastern Europe, but is a real right. neurological <laughs> condition. Um, so thank you for, for bravely sharing about that. You mm -hmm. said it was a pretty dark time and I can imagine having such a life-changing uh, illness or any, any life-changing situation, but significantly or more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's always, it, it Whenever, um, and I talk to my SDCs about this, uh, service dog coaching students about this a lot, because um, you talk about like the, um, when somebody has a sudden change and you, you think about the disability, think about, well, the person now has to learn how to use a wheelchair or a walker or, or maybe uh, a new strategy if it's, uh, if they have a traumatic brain injury, now they have to learn how to remember things or different strategies for living or adjusting. But um all of these things require time and it's not months, it's, it's often years of adjustment. Um, and if somebody has a disability that changes and it's another time for readjustment and all of these things come into play with um, service dogs uh, because you have to be thinking, um, I came at this from somebody who had already owned dogs, was already a trainer. Um, so I didn't have to try to figure out how to take care of a dog, for example, or how to feed. I already knew. I mean, I had to adjust to that, but I had to already f had some of that in place. So all of these are things that we have to think about in the service dog industry because there's a lot of implications to to that whole process. But yeah, I always I also you know joke. It's like having a really rare disease like that. My claim to fame is. I get published in the dog world, but I'm also published in the scientific literature anonymous as a patient X <laughs> genetic studies or random things like that. And you said it was you have a very rare, uh, rare what, what's the right word um, type of a rare, very rare disease. Right, that right. must have been yeah. quite hard to accept. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think I want to say it's probably. I mean, I'm. Um, I've probably spent the pr probably about the first uh, ten years trying to uh, trying to get answers. I mean, I'm. I always kind of say. I mean, I was. I'm very close here to the. Um, uh, geographically close to the National Institute of Health, so I have access to some testing and uh, researchers that many people don't have. Um, but I. Um, but definitely it was a really, uh, it's definitely been, you know, it's an eye-opening experience. You become a very good, um, I actually, I, I'm in a group with some other people who have like undiagnosed rare diseases are part of this uh, big 
massive research program for that. And I, one of the things that we find is we're all really good at reading medical literature. And uh, so we become really good at like going on Medline or the National Library of Medicine. And, and that's a skill set that has ended up serving me very well, because now with the, with the service dog industry, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm always telling my students. I'm like, look at the literature. <laughs> what does it say? What are the scientists actually saying about this? Um, because you get really good at, you know, deep diving the Internet to try to get um, try to get answers. But. You know, like I said, it's I, for me now. I find myself um, just generally interested in, um, you know, both the service dogs, the science of it, also, but also the human end of it, um, because everyone has a different story, and everyone's uh, it's it's it just every disability is a little different, even if you're working with two people who look like they have the same thing going on, and um, so anyway, I find that I actually. I, I find that aspect of having to continuously sort of change gears or look at the dog's task a different way, I find that to be um, a really exciting part of working with service dogs. Mm, you say everyone everyone has a different story. And, and I know that we have people in our, our audience that are probably in a space in their life that share similarities with you when you first got Diagnose and in so much as they're just entering the fray of new diagnosis and getting a service dog. So I'm I'm curious. Uh, I always uh, seize opportunities to talk about mental health because it's uh, I think very important. Um, you said there was a dark time for you then. How how do you feel about that initial stage? Now, what might you say to yourself, or what might you have to say to people listening to this episode that? might be just starting their journey? So I guess there's a couple of couple of things. One I probably would have said to myself is I would have said to myself, because one of the things that, and this is not going to apply to necessarily everybody, but I have a, I literally am part of the, an undiagnosed, it's literally called the undiagnosed disease program. And, um, and I'll, I have had uh, uh, DNA tests show things and then, and then researchers debate about them. And I would have said that to myself that it w I would have, I actually ended up okay even without having a specific answer. Um, I, yeah, it's been up and downs and no, nobody knows what tomorrow is going to bring. So not to, I, I spent a long time trying to actually get it's almost like, like, how could I possibly have done that? Truthfully, I don't have, a, I'm not a I'm genetic researcher myself, um, but that it was okay not to have that answer. And I also think I would have said to myself that it was okay that it took a long time to adjust, that that's normal, um, because um, that is something that, um, and I tell trainers this also when they are, in uh, getting those phone calls, because sometimes the first phone call is to a dog trainer and not a not a doctor. <laughs> sometimes that'll happen where you'll have somebody who's like, "I just got diagnosed," and I want you know. So it's like that that there is going to be an adjustment period, and and not everything that you think is going to be bad really is going to be bad. Um, and that you'll, and then the other thing I guess I would have said to myself is I did not realize how many community resources there actually were. Um, it, there is, uh, it, I guess it depends where you live. I, I wish I would have known to reach out to, to rehabilitation faster than I did. Uh, I didn't immediately get pointed to some of that, but also looking directly in the community because uh, for, in the United States, they have these centers. They, I, I assume they probably have some of these in other countries where they're called independent living centers for, and they're, they're not the same thing as assisted living or um, say a, a retirement or a nursing home. There are some of these centers that are created by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. And they are available in many communities. And I wish I would have known that um, and, and reached out to those faster because it took me several years before I even knew that existed. And uh, and when I reached out, a lot of times I I didn't have to didn't know that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel there because a lot of these centers will uh, you know get find the help in your 
there, a lot of times we just don't know it's there or we don't even consider that the resource is there. Um, and if one resource isn't being helpful, just keep going, find another one. <laughs> so, so. Instead, it, it was okay. It's okay that it might take you a long time to adjust. And you also shared when you were growing up mm-hmm. that when things weren't working, you had this attitude to try something different. And right. Has, did that serve you, your, like how you were as a young, young adult? And I'm sure the environment you grew up in, did that serve you when you got this illness? Is that helpful for trainers who might be in the similar situations now to kind of? Yes. I mean, I think um, for me, I mean, it even helped me in changing gears when I realized that it was becoming too physically difficult to continue with the in-person training. I was like, okay, well, what can I do here? And, um, and I saw the world sort of opening with this sort of, uh, you know, like, okay, well, maybe I can educate trainers or I can um, do this. So sometimes it's, um, the answers are in front of you, uh, but you're not seeing them because you're, you know, you're kind of going doing one thing. But I do think that, um, you know, being able to change gears and shift gears and I think realizing that that life isn't, it's not just like a straight trajectory. I mean, how I ended up here was very convoluted. (laughs) And so, um, and, um, and I think that, you know, just understanding that piece of it, but also realizing that, um, you know, not feeling confident um, is, it's, it's kind of normal when you've had a big change, even if the change isn't, directly related. I think sometimes something else that's really helped me is thinking of myself as a dog, <laughs> which is that I have stepped, I have done that multiple times in my life where I step back and I just go, if I were a dog, <laughs> what would be my recommendation for, for this issue? And sometimes it's been, well, you know, maybe I need a Kong with some kids, <laughs> with, with something good in it. And I just need to be in a quiet room listening to some classical music for a little bit of a downtime. But um, I think sometimes we don't give ourselves uh, the same sort of understanding that we do for, for the dog. But I, you know, it, because if you think about it too, like um, when a dog has um, a health problem, you, you can see, we know about this. We know that they it can have a behavioral you know, outcome. And so again, just sort of thinking about things a little bit with more compassion to ourselves, I think. And then also creatively and out of the box. I don't know that my doctors always like it when I think of myself as a dog, but (laughs) they don't always understand. Well, wait, what would I do? What would I say if I was a client's pet? (laughs) So, I think it's wise. (laughs) I think uh, feeling confident is not normal for the majority of the population. <laughs> no, no. So it led you to uh, pivot, as you mentioned, numerous times. You, you had numerous points where you had to pivot what you were doing. One of those is when you uh, started to form your certification program. Uh, I, I know that 2020 has been a year where uh, people have been exploring a new, or they, people firstly have had to pivot <laughs> the whole right. planet. Uh, and They've been exploring new ways of uh, doing animal training, dog training, or whatever industry they're in. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what's your journey been? What has your journey been in getting the certification program up and running? And, and what were the kind of main takeaways from you that you would want to share with others who might be looking to uh, do something with their own subject matters? So, um, well, a first thing I guess I would say is I I did look for something where there was an, a need and an, an interest. Like I um, I literally I, I talked to lots of colleagues and in, in interest in the area, and I said, okay, you know, what are you guys interested in? They said we need to learn about you know. They would tell me they wanted to learn about service dogs, and so I thought, okay, you know what? There's a real need for this. Also, it is a topic that I was passionate about anyway. So it wasn't like I was creating passion out of something that wasn't there. Um, and um, I did uh, I did consult uh, uh, quite a bit. I worked with like uh, uh, Gina, the, the people at Dog Tech. I've consult, I consulted uh, 
with attorneys, uh, you know, like every aspect of the sort of process, I did consult uh, with other people who had expertise in, in different things. And then, um, so I would say that that was essential, uh, I think, because it, I mean, I, you know, otherwise it's like you, you, you kind of going into this without, um, there's so many pieces to an uh, educational program, the learning management system, the students, uh, the, all the bits and pieces. Um, and then, um, and then uh, the website. I will say I had an, I did have an advantage with the website in that I already had some website skills. So it's like a, a strange hobby. Um, so, I, but I, so, so that, that part I could, I could handle. Um, so, but in any case, there was lots of, uh, those bits and pieces, I guess I would say to do, to, to do the background research and then to, um, and then pulling, kind of pulling all that together and then go out there and go forth into the world. I mean, the dog training community, the, many of the associations and organizations are really helpful too. Like it doesn't always have to be um, a certification program. You know, it can be like an, a course or an online something. I mean, there's a lot of venues um, to do that kind of thing now with um, not just the technology, but also working through some of the existing organizations that are out there and get your feet wet that way. Um, I, I, one of the things, I guess it's sort of funny to say here, one of the pieces that I guess I was really never expected is I didn't realize how much speaking I would have, I would end up doing. <laughs> I never, and in hindsight, I don't know why I didn't see that. <laughs> I would say that that was between, um, you know, I was like, of course you're going to be speaking. I guess I don't know why I didn't, uh, see that part, that piece in advance. But all of these things are, um, you know, one thing at a time, but, you know, realize, I guess the other piece too is, and I say this to my service dog uh, coaching, uh, to the trainers who are transitioning, their business is starting to offer a service dog uh, training the first time. Like, um, you know, I, and, and the service dog coaching program includes like things like templates and, and, you know, coach and support people in getting started. But I always tell them like, you've, a lot of times you just have to start. It's not going to look, um, you know, just, just, you know, sounding really cliche, just, just do it. Because if you don't, you're, it's never going to be, you you know, I know for myself, I think that this one dog trainers can all identify with, say, so, you know, you, you start offering your puppy training and then you're like, I want to do a package or I'm going to do this new thing. Every time you start your new thing, you go back and, and fix it and change it. It's never going to end up it, in two years, whatever it is that you're doing is not going to look like your first foot in the water at that. And so I guess I would say, you know, don't overthink it because, because you might spend, you know, months developing a plan that you end up completely changing. So, uh, you know, think, yes, you do want to plan. You don't want to go in with no plan. <laughs> you have to have a plan, but don't, um, don't, don't get it to the point where you're just uh, immobilized by the planning process. You know, take a foot, you know, take a step there and move forward. Even if it's you realize you're going to go change it up later, that's fine. Analysis paralysis comes yes. to mind. I like it. I always think uh, perfection. My, a saying that drove me with regards to ATA is perfection is the enemy of good enough, and good enough gets results. And you're going to be helping more dogs uh, right. and more humans if your stuff's out there. If, even if it's not perfect, then if it's just sat on your computer. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and I like that. So that was one takeaway I got from what you just said. The other one was uh, talk talk to your people, talk to the people that are going to be influenced by whatever you're doing. And um, there's no better place to get answers, in my personal opinion, than there. Right. Uh, and then working with the people at Dog Tech. <laughs> I was, yes. I was wondering when you were talking about that if you had consulted with Dog Tech because I know um, some other. Oh yeah, they are absolutely invaluable. <laughs> so they are amazing, absolutely. I've got a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Veronica Bautau next month. So uh, <laughs> don't be surprised if ATA turns into a certification in 2021. I'm just there joking. You go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. So tell us, tell, tell the people listening to the uh, show now, Veronica, please, if you don't mind, what is, what is a normal week, month 
is there such thing as a normal week month look for you in in 2020? Oh my gosh. So, um, sort of the mixed bag about my, uh, I was already working from home. So for me, my work didn't, uh, didn't dramatically change, but my work does change from, uh, from month to month. If I have a group of students who the service dog coaching program runs a couple times a year. So if it depends on sort of where that is, how my time looks, um, my first, uh, my first time running it, I, I had, uh, when I, when I first, you know, basically when I'm first starting a new group, I am usually sort of spending time sort of helping some of the students, um, you know, kind of just make it help sort of orienting them to the course. And I'm always, I start off usually my morning answering questions on email about discussion questions about the service dog, things like that. So that's pretty typical when I have a group of students. I also, uh, giving them feedback on their projects, so forth. Um, and then another chunk of my time is spent on, um, developing additional courses, uh, because I'm always doing, um, uh, making new sort of on on demand uh, type courses on different topics, and uh, about half of the time that I'm doing the co- like courses those on demand courses, I actually have to train my dogs. And one of the things that has been um, that's why I'm always like telling the students are always so uh, nervous about sending me video, and I'm always like, really, there's. You know, when I look at my own video, it's like there's, you know, we can all relax. We all make mistakes. It's fine. But I, when I have to take video of myself training my own dogs because I'm doing it for my courses. So, uh, so that's one of the big things is I spend a lot, a chunk of time, you know, training my own dogs, various different tasks for different, depending upon what I'm doing. Um, I always end up, you know, my uh, my my dog Sulu has been trained different tasks for different types of disabilities that he'll never actually need. <laughs> he'll never, yeah, it's like you know, hearing alert, different things like that. Um, and then the other uh, a significant another significant amount of my time is spent um, actually, uh, and Gina will will vouch for this marketing. And it, I will honestly say it's probably my least favorite activity, but it takes up (laughs) a chunk of time. Um, And I always feel like I am behind on the newest version of social media. I think I just, just started like systematically using Instagram like two weeks ago. So I I was Instagram resistant. (laughs) So, (laughs) so. So anyway, so I have to, you know, you have to kind of keep yourself going. So I have to do some version of marketing all the time. So that's my least favorite thing. My most favorite thing is, um, is actually communicating with the students and answering email questions. I actually, they cannot email me too many questions. I really, really love answering their questions. So... Well, I think as I've heard come out of the team at Dog Tech before, if you want to help more dogs uh, improve your marketing, <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me to hear you say that. Hey, just before we move on to talking mm-hmm. more in depth about service dog training and getting into service dog training, can you just direct the listeners of this episode to where they can go to find you online and get in touch? Yes, they can go to cooperativepaws.com. And uh, C O O P P A W. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't spell my own website. C O O P E R A T I V E P A W S dot com. It's a long URL, but cooperativepause.com. And uh, yeah, um, that's that's where I am. And I am on Facebook, and apparently now on Instagram. <laughs> so. <laughs> Wonderful. We will link to all of that in the show notes for this episode on the Animal Training Academy website as well. Hey, thanks so much for sharing everything so far, Veronica. We love hearing Mm -hmm. about 
people's behavioral odysseys, as we like to call mm-hmm. them. So we appreciate you sharing yours with us. Moving forward, though, I'd really like to talk, as mentioned, more about service dog training. And, and you have a special treat for us where you're going to share your top considerations for getting into mm-hmm. service dog training. But before we do that, it's important for you, you told me, that we have science-based trainers in the service dog industry. So I'm excited to hear, in your words, why is this something that's really important for you? So the service dog industry is interesting because it, it's, it has a different sort of um, trajectory of development. When you think about service dogs, um, most of the time people still think about a traditional service dog program. And it's not uncommon uh, when you look at service dog programs, when you look at maybe who the founder is or who the owner is or who is on the board of directors, to not see any dog trainers there. Um, you will see some organizations that do have dog trainers there, but it's it's not unheard of to have organizations that don't have any on, on staff. And, um, the focus of the industry kind of came at this from the perspective of helping people, which is wonderful and is an 50 is, is the important is the whole point of a service dog is to help the person. But um, one of the things that has happened is um, there is there's some myths or some that sort of go through the service dog industry. And I have one that it's I really, really don't like. And it's a sort of a service dog industry cliche. And it's the one that's a 24 seven service dog that the service dog is working 24 seven. Well, and, you know, I mean, Nobody works 24-7. And I think that we, we haven't looked enough at the industry sort of at how we can, um, you know, the, the industry is starting to be aware and people are noticing we don't want the dogs to burn out. But then how can we prevent this? How can we keep service dogs working at their absolute best and make sure that they have a great quality of life um, and are behaviorally and emotionally healthy and physically healthy so that they can perform their best work. Um, and, uh, and, and looking at the dog's needs. Um, so that is one of my things why I want, I love seeing, um, pet dog trainers and other animal trainers kind of get interested about service dogs and get into this field. Also, um, uh, absolutely, it's really important to be using the newest, uh, most effective and humane training methods. We want to make sure that's happening. And um, the other piece of it, too, are the service dog tasks themselves. Like right now, there is um, this really big explosion growth area of looking at scent-based service dog tasks like diabetic alert uh, dogs, um, but also other types of um in scent alerts. And that is a really complicated scientific area of research. You look at, you know, how, how do we um, best collect a scent sample? What are the dogs actually looking at and finding? And ha- by having, um, you know, science-based dog trainers in, the, in there really looking at this, we want to make sure that the tasks that we say dogs are doing, that the dogs really are capable of doing it, that they're really doing it. And um, also that we're, what we're asking for them is, is also from the human end of it, of course, we want to make sure that is this really helpful for the person? Is this the best way to, um, to, make, to make use of a dog's amazing, wonderful skills and talents? So if, I, if I'm listening to this podcast and I want to become a service dog trainer, do I have to reach out to you and do a certification or do I have to do some other kind of certification or can I just like start a website and be like, yo, world, what's up? I'm here. I'm <laughs> offering service dog training. Hire me. Well, of course, I would love it if... Uh, so listening to my website, who has wanted to do service dog would come to over to my website at cooperativepaws.com and take a look at the certification program. Um, basically what, um, I tell now the program is, does have, uh, prerequisites because it was designed for, for trainers that already have some experience and all that, all the details and, uh, of that are, are on the internet, on the website. But, um, I do tell trainers to sort of think about 
that's sort of five areas to think about if they want to get into training service dogs. One of them is, um, and the first one that I, I want them to think about is one that they they may already have, um, and that is a skill in training complex behavior chains because many service dog tasks are basically behavior chains. Um, and you don't need to be um, training them, you need to train them with a fairly good level of precision. And I think that sometimes people don't realize that. But if you're thinking about, say, a mobility dog that opens up a door, that's one of those tasks that on face value doesn't look that challenging. Dog grabs tether, dog pulls it. But if the dog lets go of that tether before the person has gone through the door, their wheelchair could get bashed. Um, you know, you have to think about, so you really need to have some, uh, you know, be able to cue that dog to hold on to the tether and not to release it until cued. And if this dog is doing this in public access, the logistics of how the dog's going to get back to that person's side um, and through the doorway um, also needs to be sort of thought out. So you need to know how to train complex behavior chains and also need to have skills and training things to a pretty decent level of, of precision. So it needs to be functional for that um, team. And then you need to have some knowledge about disabilities. And um, this does not mean that a person needs to have themselves themselves have a disability to train a service dog. I don't believe that at all. Um, I also uh, I don't believe that, you know, you. it's really a matter of, um, this is something that you can learn. You can learn uh, about disability culture. Um, there are lots of different resources, organizations, that same type of organization I mentioned earlier, where they have um, uh, an independent living center or organizations that are in the community for people with disabilities oftentimes will provide education like this or even give you opportunities like that. It, it's important to understand it because um, you need to have a sense as to what your client is is sort of is facing and, and dealing uh, with so that you can help them effectively. Um, then uh, the other aspect is the part that for me is somewhat boring, but necessary, <laughs> which is the legal and business aspects of it. Um, uh, you need to have your paperwork. Um, this is not the same. They're not the same risks that are uh, exist when you're training pet dogs. It's just, it's a different, um, you need to make sure that you've, you've got everything there. Um, I also, I incur, I, in some cases, I think it's absolutely essential uh, for trainer, uh, trainers to communicate with the client's healthcare provider. So you need to have paperwork sometimes to be able to do that uh, because you need to determine, is this task really appropriate for this person or what's the best way to do this task? Maybe you need to talk to the person's physical therapist or occupational therapist for how to do this. Um, so that's another aspect of it. Um, the other aspect which is the one that I get asked about probably the most is how to how to even handle the intake, how to even um, because um, uh, pet dog trainers tell me all the, a lot that they will get questions. Oh, I just adopted this dog. You know, um, he's. Uh, Maybe he's growling at people, but I want to make him a service dog. What do I do? So you got to have a process. Now, this is when I sometimes when trainers tell me about that and they, they kind of say, you know, this is you, you feel a little angry. Like, do you not know about service dogs? What do you? But the thing about it is this is somebody who has done the a wonderful thing. They've reached out for help. So and this is a situation where um Dog trainers especially are, have a really great skill set because we uh, dog trainers typically have wonderful people skills. We're used to helping people, um, you know, adjust expectations and, and, and help them out. So this is a wonderful opportunity, but at the same time, you need sort of an intake process and a system for how you're going to handle all these different requests. Some of them are going to be realistic and some of them, like everything else, are not going to be realistic and, and you have to have a process for that. Um, and in some cases, um, you know, also just a process for how you're going to assess dogs and so forth. I wanted to mention here also um, that now I think with the 2020 being what it is and 
so many more people working from home that than ever have. I've always mentioned uh, for uh, the at home service dogs because most of the time people think of service dogs, you think about a public access dog, but it's important to keep in mind that at home some people might benefit from a dog that just works at home for them, that does the tasks in the house and doesn't necessarily go everywhere. Um, now, of course, you also need to have paperwork for that, make sure the client's on board. But I mentioned that here because um, not some of the cases where somebody comes and maybe they don't have a dog that's suited for public access, some of those dogs might be able to help at home and still be. And now that we have so many people working from home, in some cases, they might really benefit from the at-home help might not necessarily always need the public access piece. So it's just something to also for pet dog trainers to sort of have in mind. Um, but along that idea of sort of having a plan of intake and how you're going to, you know, handle the inquiries, also having a plan for how you, you're you going to um, uh, help clients maintain their training over time. So just a process from sort of, and again, it's, and I, and I, and I, tell this to my graduates all the time, you know, you're going to tweak this. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect, but you do want to have a general process so that um, you have a plan. So when the client calls you and says, I want, I, I want help, I want to help selecting a dog for service work, you have a plan for what you're going to, how your answer to that question is going to be. Number, number one mm-hmm. is a skill and training complex behavior change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Number two is knowledge about disabilities. Yep. Number three is legality, the fun stuff. Number three is the fun right. stuff. All the right. paperwork. <laughs> the yeah. stuff I love doing for Animal Training Academy. Not. Right. right. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> number four is how do you handle the intake? Yep. And number five, do we cover it's number like, five? Number five is your on your process. Your, your process. Okay. So curious and if... Number four, how do you handle mm-hmm. the intake is uh, that's the one you said was the question that you get asked the most about? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's a little bit the intimidating question, um, you know, where you people are like, I got asked to train a service dog. What do I do next? <laughs> so, um, you know, or, you know, somebody just called me, they got a new puppy and they want to train it for service dog. And what do I do now? Um, so you need like a plan for how you're going to address those initial cases. And it might be that uh, there's lots of different ways. It doesn't have to be, you know, every business has its own, um, I, when I was at, it's sort of like, a, I mean, every every dog trainer has their own sort of style for running their business. So uh, uh, I don't like giving a formula because it might not work for, it depends on some of this is geographical too. And depending on your location, um, I did a lot of my intake screening on the internet. Like I actually did very little on the phone. I had a lot of the initial process. People would fill out online form. They would submit it. I would respond back on email and we would set up an initial, uh, uh, virtual appointment. So, and that, that worked great in my area, but that might not work for every geographical area. So one of the things that I do talk to students about is, um, you know, these are some possibilities and then we discuss what's, what's, what feels comfortable to you, because it also might be that, um, you know, you might have one trainer who really wants to jump in a particular area of service dog work and only do that particular specialty type. And you might have another who wants to do something else. So those are all sort of aspects of things to have in mind when you're running in. But I do think it's important to have an intake process because otherwise, um, you know, you don't want to be finding that you're spending a lot of time on the phone giving people information on service dog laws um, because that can happen. Like you'll have people calling you that they wanted service dog, they wanted therapy dog, but they didn't know there was a difference between a therapy dog and a service dog. Like if you spend all day Def- being basically people's, you know, uh, phone or email Google, that's going to be frustrating. <laughs> so <laughs> you want to have that. Um, maybe you have the information on your website or you have, you need to streamline your process. So so if, if a potential client rang you tomorrow mm-hmm. and said, 
Hey Veronica, I just uh, uh, purchased this dog and I want it. To, I want to. I want it to be a service dog. Uh, what would you say to them? <laughs> what would <laughs> What would be your first uh, so approximation the for that? Approximation. Eh? So I want, you called me up and you said, "I want to train this dog to be a service dog." So I, because I really didn't like the phone, the person would have emailed me. <laughs> <laughs> they would have, and so I would have then pointed them to an informational place on my website that had a whole, like a little bullet point, nice, friendly written, or maybe responded to them with a file that said, this is the information that I need from you next. And after I get this information, I'll tell you what our next steps are. You know, I would have said, oh, thank you so much for emailing me. This is great that you're looking for help for training your service dog. These are going to be, and um, my next um Typical next step would would have been a phone uh, uh, or virtual appointment with them to um, again gather more information, also learn more about their needs and dogs, and then kind of move forward from there. But uh, again, there's different businesses might do it different way. I have some SDCs that are doing orientations um, because they get so many, so that they'll just do like we have orientation on this day. You have to attend our orientation, <laughs> and so there's lots of different ways of. Um, of handling and streamlining your your interest, the, the wonderful, huge interest that we now have about service dogs. So for people listening to this podcast who are wondering what that informational piece on your website that you might direct people to is, do you, do you have a blog or do is you it, have resources that are free that people can have a look at? I, I have a blog and I often um, put quite a bit there on on my um, on my blog. I have a free newsletter that they are welcome to absolutely sign up, up for as well. So I have a lot. And I um, those are the, those are the main two that I do, but periodically people will see me pop up on either podcasts or things like that and I'll usually announce these things on pe- on my Facebook page as well. Cool. And the blog is linked from your website. Yes. Yes. Actually, just people go to cooperativepause.com and they scroll, they'll see the blog posts there. Okay. And so let's say I'm a trainer and I'm listening to this episode and uh, I've been searching for or considering becoming a, a service dog trainer and I've been looking for uh, a upskilling myself in this area so your mentioning of the certification process has tweaked my interest Mm -hmm. um what what would be my next steps and and what would be my expectations if i was to get involved with the certification process what would be involved so basically it is a three month it's a 12-week program and it involves um it's an it's an online program where I delivered the information through uh, videos and also um, there's written information and then um, there's little quizzes and then there's some projects. Um, the training project, uh, there are two training projects where students submit video of their work training a dog, um, service dog tasks um, that they also need to complete. Um, the other thing that I, I, one of the things that I've been encouraging people to do too is if they're interested, um, is also to look at the on demand courses that I have. If you go on the website, it says service dog courses, because um, those are short courses that um, can give uh, people a flavor of what uh, my instructional style is like. So it's sort of a nice way to dip in a foot without jumping fully into the certification program if they just want to learn a little bit more. Um, Of course, people are welcome to jump to apply for the certification program, but sometimes people want to take a short course first and uh, get a sense of it. Um, And uh, the one that um, there's, they're there with different sort of focuses. The one service dog fundamentals is there with just sort of the basic information. And then there's some others that are on service dog task trainings. Well, cool. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And like I mentioned earlier, we will link to all of us in the show notes for this episode. Uh, I have a ton of questions that are going to remain unanswered at this point in time because I'm looking at how long we've been going and acknowledging we should probably uh, start to head towards the end of the episode. So I'd just like to share gratitude to you for everything you've shared so far. We do have uh, one question we like to ask 
ask all of our guests before we finish, that is, Veronica, uh, you started mm-hmm. off with taking us back to your childhood uh, and then you mm-hmm. uh, kindly shared with us everything that you're currently doing with your work uh, in your service dog training. Now that I'd like to ask you to please take us into the future, what is your vision? What do you want to see happen over the next five to ten years? So I think I'm already starting to see it, but I would love to see um, uh, dog trainers and with uh, and a focus in the service dog industry that um, increasingly just looks at the animals needs. So looking at the needs of working dogs and making sure that they're they're so valuable and they're so helpful. And you know, to steal an Oprah Winfrey quote, making sure that dogs are living their best lives. <laughs> so making sure that the working dogs are having uh, as 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 great and as wonderful as they can improve the quality of life of a person and want them to also have an amazing and wonderful quality of life. And does that, does that start with doing basic training with the dog first that's not really service related? I'm just thinking about police dog examples and Steve White going in uh, from my understanding what Steve White does. Sorry, Steve White, if I butcher this. Or, or, or Ken Ramirez, actually, I'm thinking of as well, who kind of train those essential stuff first and then say, and then we do the police dog training. Right. I mean, I think it, there's so many aspects to it. It's one, uh, considering the training that we do at the beginning, also, the things that we can think about is, um, you know, at what when do we do uh, public access? How old does the dog need to be public access? How old does the dog need to be when we place the dog as a full throttle uh, service dog? Um, you know, it's not uncommon to have uh, dogs being placed for full throttle service work, public access at 19 months. That can be young for some dogs. Like, what if we waited six more months? <laughs> Would that make a big difference? Or also, like, um, you know, teaching handlers, because service dog handlers, unlike police office, uh, the canine handlers, they, they canine handlers are canine handlers. Service dog handlers are not professional animal handlers. So how can we prepare the animal, the, the service dog handlers, because we spent a lot of time teaching them how to handle their dog, how to handle public access confrontation, how to be polite and how to handle if you get a question or clean up after the dog if something unexpected happens, but how do they, making sure they know how to assess stress? How do they know when to give their dog a break? How do they know when to give their dog downtime? Do they have a plan for what if, um, you know, what if the, the dog really needs a week off or a day off, or maybe their work schedule is just too demanding, or maybe their dog work schedule wasn't that demanding now, but now that their dog is seven or eight or nine or 10 years old, the dog's starting to show some signs that maybe the dog doesn't want to go to work all day and then go to a movie at night. Um, so like things like that, and just thinking about, because our, the handlers for service dogs are not professionals and they need like, um, they're not necessarily, they're not, they might, they love their dogs. There's absolutely no question they love the dog, but they might not pick up on signs of stress uh, that are more subtle. So things like that. I like your answer. And I get the feeling from this whole conversation we've had today that you put a big emphasis on the human as a learner. Uh, one of my uh, things that I really in, mm-hmm. uh, enjoyed hearing from you is that people can take those short courses from you to, to get a flavor of whether your instructional style is uh, something that's going to resonate with them, which I, which I see as a sign of a great teacher, someone okay. I would be comfortable learning from just knowing that they have that awareness that they might not be <laughs> the best teacher for me. I, I, uh, I love thank that. you so much. That was thanks to the six-year-olds who taught me that a long time ago. <laughs> Go work with children to learn that lesson. Um, I'm curious with regards to your opinion and, and in your words, uh, do, you, do you feel there are some characteristics that make for successful service dog humans? Um, yes, I think that um, I think that the one thing that I'll say about pet dog trainers is oftentimes the people that are contacting them for service dog support often are actually because they 
are interested in the training piece. Otherwise, um, you know, they, they're not applying to a program. But I do think that it's, uh, um, it's not that, it's, it is a little bit different from, because you want to have a person that obviously could benefit from the help a service dog can give them. Otherwise, why are they, you know, having a service dog? But it's also like choosing who's going to be a great pet dog owner <laughs> because it needs to be someone who is also, um, you know, has has the, you know, just logistical ability to meet the dog's needs, take care of the dog, wants to play with the dog, is interested in connecting with the dog, um, those kind of kinds of characteristics. Awesome. We'll wrap it up there, I think. So at this point, I uh, would like to say a massive thank you again for sharing everything, Veronica. We did, we've mentioned it numerous times before, but I know people have been so engrossed in what you've been saying, they haven't had time to uh, write down where they can go to find out more. So can you just share with the listeners of the show one last time before we finish, where they can go to find out more information about you, your work, and to get in touch? Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. You can go to cooperativepause.com. Again, I'll say it slowly, cooperativepause.com. That's my website. They can click on the contact page. And also there are links there to go to my social media. Veronica Sanchez, people growing, blowing up on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) I won't even know what to do if that happens. (laughs) What? Do you know, what is your Instagram handle? Or what is your Instagram See, like, name? look at this. I don't actually know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just know that I have one because I've clicked on it and it's there. And I think other people are clicking little hearts there sometimes. So I take that as a positive. <laughs> we will so. see if those hearts are reinforcing Veronica's behavior over the coming months of December, <laughs> January, and February. <laughs> right. It's pretty sad. I didn't even know that there was a, such a thing as a handle for Instagram. So look, I've learned. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I listen to podcasts about social media and I can resonate strongly with the challenge of keeping up with, uh, and if anyone can hear looking right now, that's Phoebe Dog, not me. <laughs> um, I resonate with the challenge of keeping up with the changing landscape that is social media. Mm-hmm. So yeah. apparently we should be on TikTok and Snapchat. and I know. I know, but it looks like for TikTok, we have to make like really short, cute videos. <laughs> Phoebe, you up for it? I think Phoebe would be. <laughs> she says, I am, Dad. Are you up for it? And yeah. Dad says, not quite yet. <laughs> Instagrams, <laughs> I, I agree with Veronica. Uh, I'm the steep enough learning curve right now. Mm-hmm. But let's uh, wrap it up there. Once again, thank you so much uh, for your time today for uh, Veronica, this has been so much fun. So on from from me and on behalf of everyone listening, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive funnest choice rich ways then as mentioned at the start of this episode the animal training academy community is waiting for you head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the netflix social media platform for behavior geeks that's it for this episode though we're going to wrap it up there thanks again so much everyone for listening You'll hear from us again soon.